Let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we get ready to enter into your Sabbath and into this presentation, I ask that you would pour your Spirit out on us, that you would forgive us, Lord, of our shortcomings. Our desire, Lord, is to share the last message of warning to the perishing world and give the trumpet a certain sound. Guide our hearts and mind tonight. Hide me behind the cross as I speak and talk about issues of the greatest magnitude. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> it's June. 2015, and in a few weeks, it will be three years since I first heard about the foundational teachings of Adventism. Three years. And now, I didn't even know three years ago that I was going to even have a ministry, or, or even be speaking to people. In fact, before that, I didn't, um, I didn't like to speak to people or didn't like to get up in front or, or say anything to anybody uh, in a public setting. And uh, I felt so convicted that the Seventh-day Adventist movement and God's people at the end of the world have been given such a powerful message that I could not remain silent and also became convicted that to remain silent would be the, the, the peril of my own salvation. And so here we are tonight and we are coming to what I would consider to be the final phase of my ministry, and I'm, I don't know where things are going to go, but I, I believe that we're entering into a turning point. We're, e we're entering into the last hope for Adventism. I believe that God's people are going to be given one final chance to turn away from unimportant things, from turning away from following the leading of uh, the worldly churches uh, and putting their faith and trust in man and turn back to the Word of God and to the prophetic message that we have to share with the world, which is the first, second, and third angel's message. And I believe that one of the things that I have um, been given the privilege of sharing or, 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 il or demonstrating or illustrating or whatever you would have it called is that when, when I first came to the realization that there was a major uh, disagreement within Adventism, uh, in regard to um, turning against our foundational teachings, and that a series of events that started, you know, even over 150 years ago with rejecting some of the foundational teachings that God had given to his people in 1843 and 1844, and even before that, and step by step, a process has led Adventism to this great crisis that it's in right now. A crisis of proportions that we don't even understand or even can foresee. Um, every wind of doctrine is blowing with Adventism. And because wave after wave after wave of disagreement and uncertainty and biblical interpretation has come into Adventism. Defenses are up all over the place. 
so that when you bring the truth to Seventh-day Adventists, when you bring the very message that God gave us at the foundation of our work and you show it to them, they don't even understand what it is or even recognize it because they have never heard it before. In this little book that I carry around and I, you know, use quotes out of it, it's a compilation and there are certain pitfalls to compilations, but nonetheless, there's some good quotes in this little book, Last Day Events. Last Day Events, page 210. I want to read, actually I'm going to, I'm going to start on page 209 because the prophet of the Lord is going to give us instruction here that the very message that God gave us would be rejected by his people. Uh, it's called uh, Last Day Events, page 209. There is to be in the Seventh-day Adventist churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door of their heart by confession and repentance. In the manifestation of that power which lightens the earth with the glory of God, they will see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous, something which will arouse their fears and they will brace themselves to resist it because the Lord does not work according to their ideas and expectations, they will oppose the work. Why, they say, should we not know the Spirit of God when, we've been in the, when we have been in the work so many years? Review and Herald Extra, December 23, 1890. Review and Herald Extra, December 23, 1890. In other words, there is to be, Mrs. White is projecting into the future, there's going to be a glorious manifestation of the power of God. But when it comes to those that have been into the work for many years, they're going to say, no, 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 that's not it. Who are they that have been in the work for many years? Are, are, are they not in leadership? If you're in the work and you're into it for many years, you are in a leadership position, amen? And that leadership position could be evangelistic coordinator at the local church and go all the way up to the general conference. But when this manifestation of the power of God comes, they will see only in their blindness something they think is dangerous, something that will uh, arouse their fears. They will brace themselves to resist it. Going on, this quote from Review and Herald May 27th, 1890, the third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will lighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. Review and Herald, May 27th, 1890. So Mrs. White is telling us at the end of the world here that the third angel's message will not even be comprehended. I don't want to make light of this, but brothers and sisters, I have just spent several months and even this last year giving out a series of surveys to Seventh-day Adventists, not to judge them because they don't know certain things, but to illustrate to them that they don't even really actually know what they believe. And Mrs. White says it, I'm not saying it, the third angel's message will not be comprehended. We have... Uh, uh, three angels this. We, we, we have, you know, um, I want to tell you a little story. And, and I don't want to, uh, um, I'm not trying to slander anybody or anything like this. But there's a, there's a ministry in, uh, that's going around and they have a, uh, they take 1844 and... Um, they call 1844 time of the end. And I went to this presentation. This is an employee, a conference employee and an evangelist. A Seventh-day Adventist evangelist works for one of the conferences in the Northwest, has a, has a, uh, a timeline and calls 1844 the time of the end. And most Seventh-day Adventists uh, sit there and they see this PowerPoint presentation that this guy does. And, he, you know, he's probably a real nice guy. I've talked to him. He seems like a nice guy. But brothers and sisters, 
If you say that 1844 is the time of the end, you're, call, you're carrying the for, false torch of Satan. It's the torch of false prophecy. And what happens is that Seventh-day Adventists, they just hear 1840, oh yeah, 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 1844, yeah, we believe that. You know why that's such a dangerous teaching right there? Because if you say that the time of the end is 1844, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And verse 4. We're not going to go into studying tonight in a detailed way how to illustrate when the time of the end is. But let's look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And the Bible says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So according to this passage here, this book right here, the book of Daniel, the little book, is unsealed at the time of the end. Amen? So if we call 1844 the time of the end, then we're saying that the book is not what? Open. open. Book not open until 1844. Amen? Mm -hmm. Do you realize if you say that, you have just taken the first angel and the second angel's message and completely thrown them out the window. Amen? And so we have in our churches, because we don't have an understanding of what we believe, because we don't have an understanding of the nature of 1844 and an understanding of the nature of the 1260-year prophecy, we have people coming into our pulpits and saying, 1844, the time of the end. And the average Adventist only knows certain key phraseologies. And so they hear 1844, yeah, yeah, 1844. We need more of that. Somebody will say, three angels' message. Yeah, 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 three angels' message. I believe in that. But when you try and get it in the nuts and bolts and illustrate to people, hey, this is what the three angels' message is. Huh? I don't know that. What does she say? The third angels' message will not be comprehended. And a comprehension means it can't, it's not understood. So we're throwing around phraseology like time of the end. We're throwing around phraseology like present truth. We're throwing around phraseology like the three angels' message. But when it comes to give an account for this and this, we simply can't do it. And that is the crisis that we're in. Because the Sunday law is coming. And so on page... 209, and I've used this quote a lot, but this is really what we're trying to focus on right here. Page 209, this is from Review and Herald, December 18th, 1888. December 18th, 1888. This was, this was published just a few days after the uh, Blair Bill in Congress was heard. It does not seem possible to us now that any should have to stand alone, but if God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we, ha when we shall be brought before councils and before thousands for his name's sake, and each one of us will have to give a reason of his faith. faith. Then will come the severest criticism upon every position that has been taken for the truth. We need then to study the word of God that we may know why we believe the doctrines we advocate. So what happens here at the end of the world is that we have all these things that we talk about in Sabbath school and we do a just surface study. And when we ask, well, how do you get to 1844? When is the time of the end? We, most of us have not the foggiest. We're in a real crisis, a real crisis. And of course, historically and literally, we understand through Bible prophecy that the time of the end began in 1798. Amen? Amen? And so what happens here is this, 
this area right here between 1798 and the, and the autumn of 1844 is the time for the first and the second angel's message. This right here, brothers and sisters, is where the foundations of Adventism were laid. The day for a year principle, the understanding of the 2300 day prophecy, the understanding of the 1260 year prophecy, the 1290, the 1335, the daily, and yes, the 2520. Amen? Amen. And that's right, I said it, the 2520. Brothers and sisters, we're using methodologies to study the Bible that are not endorsed by the Bible. Okay? So, I mean, again, let, let's, let's talk about this. Did God know in advance that the King James Version of the Bible was going to be written? Did he know in advance that the King James Version in the English language was going to be the version of the Reformation in America and in other places that speak English? Do you believe that God put a hedge of protection around his word and that the things that were in it were specifically for us at the end of the world so that we could understand what we believe? Yes. Are we not told, both in the memoirs of William Miller and in the book Great Controversy, that God led the mind of William Miller and he laid aside all preconceived ideas and opinions and with a simple crudence concordance and the Bible he methodically went through the scriptures and laid out the foundations of studying the Bible and understanding prophecy the through the King James Bible and so what happens here is now brothers and sisters we have people that are saying no 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 you have to go to the Greek and the Hebrew only well, if Miller had done that, we would have no Adventism. That's a fact. That is a simple fact. So, how many people are aware of this? L let, me just, let me just do this, okay? There is many in Adventism that don't understand that um, you need a second and third witness. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let all things be established, right? So we're not going to go into a deep study on that, but anybody that's watching this can go in their concordance or do a search on uh, second witness, and you'll find out, you'll find several quotes in regard to this. You can go into the book of Genesis and see the story of, of uh of Joseph, how he told Pharaoh that the, the dream was doubled unto you because the thing is made certain, right? So how many people here would, uh, you know, you go next door to your neighbor and you, you want to share the Sabbath with them, right? So what you do is you take out your Bible, you say, I'm here to, sh I'm here to share the Sabbath with you. Oh, good, we're going to have a Bible study. Yep, we're going to have a Bible study. Uh, take and open uh, your Bible to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 20. And we're going to start reading at um, verse 8. Are you ready? Sure. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, we're done with the study. We don't have to give any more witnesses, right? We're done. How effective do you think that would be? Not very effective? I mean, it's just common sense, right? You would want to go from one place to another. You would want to establish that the Sabbath was never done away with. Okay, let's try another one. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to prove the state of the dead. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man 
of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Now you have to accept what I believe in the state of the dead. Is that how it works? It doesn't make sense, does it? It's irrational, brothers and sisters. Okay, how about this one? Turn with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And the Bible says, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then, will the, then the sanctuary shall be, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, we're done. 1844. Is that how we would do it? And even if you strung along the other quotes that substantiate the sanctuary be cl being cleansed in 1844, the beginning of the heavenly sanctuary investigative judgment, even if you had several texts to prove Daniel 8.14 had a starting date and an ending date, you would still only have one prophecy, one time prophecy that substantiated 1844. And so, it just doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense to do that. And so, why is it this? Okay, I want to pull up a quote right here. Okay, I'm ready. This quote is from... Review and Herald, November 25, 1884. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted in the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology. And so what Ellen White is saying is if, that if you're giving the third angel's message, you're going to be following the same rules of biblical interpretation as was used by William Miller in the little book that she just named. And if you go to William Miller's little book in his 14th rule, it says that you don't have to understand Greek or Hebrew. That this Bible right here is sufficient for your salvation, right? So what happens here is that here, if you tell people at the end of the world here that this one quote, that we go by Miller's rules, and then Miller's rules tell you that you compare what? Scripture. scripture with Scripture, right? Because if you're going to substantiate something, you have to have a second witness. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. But let's just look at it like this, okay? I'm going to do something really, really easy here. I'm going to give an example of this hot, not as hot as it was a couple years ago, but this issue of the 2520, right? Of course, in uh, Leviticus chapter 26, the seven times is, is, uh, is illustrated there, and the early Adventists called this the seven times of the Gentiles. And of course, what we say is that a time is a year, which is 360 biblical days. This, is, this equals a time, right? And so this times seven, so seven times 360 equals 2520, okay? Now, we can put this whole argument to bed really quickly and really simply without going into all these deep studies, especially if somebody only believes that they need a second witness, no, no second witness, right? So here's how it goes. The first thing you do is you ask somebody, do you believe in Ellen White's writings? If they say yes, then you take them to this quote right here. Then, once you go to this quote right here, that's going to lead you to this little book right here. Right? This is by William Miller. This is the book that Ellen White endorses. This is the exclusive biblical interpretation that Ellen White endorses views of the prophecies and prophetic chronology by William Miller. And if you turn to page 
23, in this little book, it says, the most important rule of all is that you must have faith. It must be a faith that requires sacrifice and if tried would give up the dearest object on earth, the world and all its desires. Character, living, occupation, friends, home, comforts, worldly honors. If any of these should hinder our believing any part of God's word, it would show our faith to be in vain. Nor can we ever believe so long as one of these motives lies lurking in our hearts. We must believe that God will never forfeit his word. And we can have confidence that he who takes notice of the sparrow and numbers the hairs of our head will guard the translation of his own word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who seriously trust in God, oh, sincerely trust in God and put implicit confidence in his word from erring far from the truth, though they may not understand Hebrew and Greek. So when you give this quote right here, and Mrs. White is endorsing this book, you now say this, connect the dots. E.G. White, E.G. White, tells us to go to who? Miller. Miller, right? Miller is going to give us instruction on how to interpret God's Word. Okay? Miller says that you don't need... Hebrew or Greek. Now, let me explain something. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to discourage somebody if they have a passion for wanting to know some languages or something. But we don't have to have it. If you say we have to have it, then you've just created another situation of popery. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because what happens is for 1,260 years, when the Roman Catholic Church forbid the studying of the Bible and they kept the Bible in a dead language, Latin, that virtually nobody understood or spoke, they had to rely solely on who? The priest. And this is what has come into Adventism. We've created a system where theologians that expertise in Greek and Hebrew has basically told us, well, you can't really know what the Bible says unless you know Greek or Hebrew. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I, mean, I think a lot of have gotten the verse the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. Yes. We have to keep that in mind all the time. Amen. Wisdom in the world is foolishness to God. So, let's look at our little study here. We go to Ellen White. We go to this quote. We're in defense of this topic right here. Okay? We go to Ellen White's writings. She tells us, go to Miller. We went to Miller. Miller says, you don't need this, right? Miller also says that a time equals 360 days, right? Using the biblical rules of interpretation that has been laid forth by Miller. So therefore, there is no other way using this formula to come up with anything other than this right here. Because seven times, if a time equals 360, then seven times has to equal 2520. End of story. Seriously. It's the end of story. And if we, if we say it doesn't, then we have to reject the 1260 year prophecy. We have to reject this because this is three and a half times. So if three and a half times equals 1260, then seven times, seven times has to then equal 2520. There is no other way. And, and, and there is, for those that, most of those that are against the understanding of the 2520, always say you don't need a second rule because why why I mean a second rule you don't need a second witness and the reason they're saying you don't need a second witness is because the only one witness they have to substantiate 1844 is the 2300 day prophecy right 
So the whole argument is you don't need a second witness for 1844. The 2300 days, that's good enough, right? So you build on their foundation. I believe it's a false foundation. You build on that foundation. You say, okay, you don't need a second witness. You believe Ellen White? Of course, if they don't believe in Ellen White, we're done, <laughs> right? So they believe in Ellen White. Check. Ellen White tells us to go to Miller. If you believe in Ellen White, you check that. Miller tells us you don't need Greek or Hebrew, you check that. And so since Miller says a time equals 360 days, then seven times has to equal 2520. Check, done, end of story. There's no more to be said. And if you take out any one of these components, you're actually saying you don't believe Ellen White's a prophet. Simple as that. There's no other way to do it. Because the only defense they have against the 2520 is this right here. You know, I was over at a, a brother's house, invited me over for lunch a couple months ago. And he invited me over because in the Sabbath school class, this little debate amongst those in Sabbath school about the biblical interpretation. And um, this guy was in Sabbath school class and he goes, well, the only really way that any of us can really understand or study the Bible is if we speak Greek or Hebrew. And I said, oh, on the contrary. Au contraire. Au contraire. And I carry this little book around with me. And I said, hey, look at this little book right here. You ever seen this? Uh-uh. No, never seen this. Oh, really? How many people in here are given the third angel's message? Mm, okay. Well, according to this quote right here, and I always carry my laptop, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that's found in this book. So if you're not using that plan and you believe Ellen White's a prophet, you must not be giving the third angel's message. Uh, Review and Herald, November 25, 1884. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan Father Miller adopted in the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies in Prophetic Chronology. Okay? So, if you believe Ellen White's a prophet, you have to accept that you don't need this. But most people don't know that this book exists. You know, recently I was at a trip and I was giving some presentations um, to students at Southern University and I had about 10 minutes to kill before I was going to give a presentation. And I took this little book out right here and I went up to the uh, library desk thing and there was three people back there and I said, hey, you guys got this little book right here? And they said, let me see it. And they looked it up and they looked it up in one database and they couldn't find it. They looked it up in another database. Like, I don't know, they have different ways of looking things up. And they couldn't find it. And they said, no, we, th we do, this library does not have a copy of this book. And I said, well, you know, this is fascinating. Because uh, at this college here, we're training uh, young men and women to give the third angel's message to the entire world and send them out into the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, according to Spirit of Prophecy, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are going to be searching the scriptures upon the same plan found in this little book, and this school doesn't even have a single copy of it. So what are they using to interpret the Bible? That's how far we've come. That's a serious situation. This right here, this quote right here, puts this whole thing in perspective. And there, Ellen White says the same thing in a multiple amount of ways. In this particular quote, she's completely spelled it out. In the Great Controversy, she spells it out in a different way. In the chapter, An American Reformer, you read that chapter and Miller, in his own words, puts these rules to work so that you can see how the Bible comes alive. But what happens is, when we take the foundations of Adventism 
when we take the th first, second, and third angel's message to Adventism today, what, what do they say? Review and Herald, May 27, 1890. The third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will lighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. It won't be comprehended. These methodologies right here will not be comprehended. Brothers and sisters, the first angel's message is based on the prophetic periods. Okay? Because the first angel's message, go with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And verse 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel the everlasting good news, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So we have here the hour of His judgment has come. So in order to understand that, we have to compare Scripture to, with Scripture and understand that at the end of the world, there's this thing called the judgment hour. Amen? But in order to know when the judgment hour is, you have to understand the prophetic periods that are illustrated in the Bible. So the first angel's message, which is the judgment hour cry, all you have to do is go into the writings of Ellen White and she'll see in there that she illustrates the first angel's message as being called the judgment hour cry and that judgment hour cry is based on the prophetic periods and the very prophetic periods that we believed at the foundations of Adventism to prove the judgment hour cry we don't understand today so when you bring it up to people once again the third angel's message will not be comprehended and Mrs. White says you can't have a third angel's message without a what? A first and a second. They build on each other. Amen? They build on each other. So here's what we're doing. If the first angel's message is based on the prophetic periods, and it is, do a word search on prophetic periods in Mrs. White's writings. If you don't understand the prophetic periods, how do you understand the third angel's message? You can't. And so at the end of the world at the Sunday Law, when we're told by the spirit of prophecy that every one of our beliefs, every one of our doctrines that we advocate will come under the severest criticism and that we have to give an account for what we believe. And other places, she talks about those that have a superficial understanding of, of what we believe in God's Word are going to be what? Confused. They're not going to be able to give an account for what we believe and what's going to happen is Satan is going to sweep them up into uncertainty and they will be like the unwise virgins, brothers and sisters, because they don't have the experience, they don't have the knowledge that they need because they only have a superficial understanding. They were going off of the understanding of the other virgins. They were riding their coattails, so to speak. And we're told that, we have, that you can't transfer your experience to another person. Adventism soon, very soon, is going to come under the severest criticisms of what we can imagine. Brothers and sisters, the papacy is coming in power like never before. There are so many leaders that have been going to visit the Pope in this past year that even the visiting president of Russia doesn't surprise us. The, Putin was there this week. You know, Putin was visiting with the Pope. I don't know what they were talking about. But we know this, that this guy is going all over the world and the, and the papacy is coming into power that it's never seen before. Not in our lifetime anyway. This guy is even surpassing John Paul II with the inroads that he's making all over the world. Brothers and sisters, we have a Seventh-day Adventist that's running for president of the United States. And I don't know how far he's going to get, but I can imagine that if he even gets past the first tier of the primaries, that someone, some savvy reporter, 
will uh, do an investigation of what uh, Brother Carson claims to believe, that he claims to believe a Seventh-day Adventist. And um, I could see it kind of like this. He goes on uh, Fox News or CNN or CBS or one of these news networks, and he's being interviewed about his policies, and you know he's sitting there, and the interviewer says, uh, Dr. Carson, can I ask you a question? Yes. You're a Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, I am. Do you really believe that the Pope is the Antichrist? Do you believe that those that keep Sunday are going to receive the mark of the beast? What do you think is going to happen? Even if Dr. Carson says, well, I don't personally believe that the Pope is the Antichrist, what will happen is, and I'm not saying that he doesn't, I'm just saying if he does say that he doesn't believe that, because you know there are Adventists today that are saying that they don't believe the Pope is the Antichrist. What will happen is the millions of viewers that are watching it, whether he says it or not, they're going to be informed that that's what Seventh-day Adventists do believe. Now, as you know, the, the Pope is viewed as this, this friendly old granddad, right? This, he's just like old granddad. And so he's just so nice and kind and kisses babies and hugs children and does all these things. And you really believe that guy's the Antichrist? You see what kind of a effect this could have on the population? Who is it that says that this guy is of the devil? You see the kind of controversies that could come up? Yes. So a series of events is about to transpire. The Pope is coming in power. Adventism is being torn apart by various forms of biblical interpretation. And the biggest crisis that we're in is that we claim to be giving the third angel's message and yet we have no concept of really what it is. We don't even stand it, understand it. And like to quote Mrs. White, we, we don't comprehend it and we call it a false light when we see it. 1888 is really reoccurring. And so I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that with all the things that are coming into play, the Pope and an Adventist running for president and the schisms within Adventism and the fact that we don't know what we believe are all creating a perfect storm that when the light does come to God's people and we're told, uh, again, I'll, I'll give this quote right here, how you find it on the Ellen White C.E. ROM is you put in the word, the term, turning points. It's the only place this brings up, well, uh, oh, you have to put it in, uh, in quotations. Turning points. Found in uh, Bible Echo. The Bible Echo, August 26, 1895. There are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and of the church. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. If it is received, there is spiritual progress. If it is rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. And so here we are in Adventism. We are at a turning point. We are at a crisis. And if you believe in the spirit of prophecy, when in these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. I don't know 100% of all the light that God is going to shine on His people, but I do know this, that there is a movement within Adventism, a worldwide movement, that it is pushing and encouraging God's people to understand the truths that were laid down at the foundation of our work, to understand the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of the third angel's message and how to explain the third angel's message so that at the Sunday law, we can give an account for what we believe. And I pray that God's people 
at the General Conference session, which is just a few weeks away now, will heed the warning to come into line and to turn back to the old paths so that we can move forward and share the everlasting gospel with every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have a message that builds up. It doesn't tear down. We have a message that empowers the individual to be able to grow, go forward and give the last loud cry message to the world. This is a message like no other. This is instruction like no other. You gave this instruction. It is not in the reason of man, but in the will of God. These truths were laid down at the foundation of our work. And like Revelation chapter 10 says, thou must prophesy again. We have no new message. We need to turn back to the old paths. We need to learn what it is to be Seventh-day Adventists again so that we do not reject the advancing light. Let us comprehend the third angel's message and walk in the light of its advancing glory. I lift up your leaders and the church and its members, and I ask for forgiveness on behalf of your people where we have turned aside again and again and again. So many times you've given your church an opportunity to go back into the old paths to finish the work that we were given to do. But again and again and again, we have turned away from that work to go ser search out other fields. And Lord, uh, we ask forgiveness on behalf of our people and behalf of ourselves. And we lift you up, Lord, and ask that you would pour out your spirit on this general conference session, but only if we would humble ourselves and turn to you with all of our hearts is our prayer in your name. Amen.